In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all our enemies through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Today is the third Sunday in Lent. Our scripture readings help us to focus our attention on what true worship really is ascribing worth to our God. In the Old Testament lesson, we see the Ten Commandments God gives us. This is our opportunity to show God what he's worth to us by obeying his commands. Our motive for doing that, of course, is that God is the one who has saved us. 
Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt where you were slaves. You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not make any carved image for yourself or a likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or be subservient to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I follow up on the guilt of the fathers with their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren, if they also hate me. But I show mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not permit anyone who misuses his name to escape unpunished. Remember the Sabbath day by setting it apart as holy. Six days you are to serve and do all your regular work, but the seventh day shall be a Sabbath rest to the Lord your God. Do not do any regular work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your cattle, nor the alien who is residing inside your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. In this way, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may spend many days on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of our God. Give your attention now to the grade school, grades 6 through 8, as they sing an anthem.
Our second lesson from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Why? Why was Jesus condemned? So that we are not. There is no condemnation. But because Jesus has set me free from condemnation, he's also set me free to serve him and follow him in my life. So then there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Indeed, what the law was unable to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did when he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin, God condemned sin in his flesh so that the righteous decree of the law would be fully satisfied in us who are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. To be sure, those who are in harmony with the sinful flesh think about things the way the sinful flesh does, and those in harmony with the spirit think about things the way the spirit does. Now, the way the sinful flesh thinks results in death, but the way the spirit thinks results in life and peace. For the mindset of the sinful flesh is hostile to God, since it does not submit to God's law, and in fact, it cannot. Those who are in the sinful flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the sinful flesh, but in the spirit If indeed God's Spirit lives in you, and if someone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that person does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. This is the word of our God. Our verse of the day, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. We stand out of respect for the gospel of our Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. Glory be to you, O Lord. Here we see Jesus cleansing the temple and then pointing to his own death and resurrection by which we are set free. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. He made a whip of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courts, along with the sheep and oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews responded, What sign are you going to show us to prove you can do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews said, It took 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. Then they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let us confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, 
He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen again to words from our Gospel lesson, John chapter 2. I'll read verses 14 through 17. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. He made a whip of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courts along with the sheep and oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, 
Zeal for your house will consume me. This is the word of our God. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, it's important for us to ask as we come into the house of God today, what is worship? What do you think when you come through those doors to worship? The American Heritage Dictionary defines this verb to honor and love as a deity or to regard with ardent or adoring esteem or devotion. The word worship comes from an old English word, which really means to ascribe worth to something. So I ask, as you come to worship, what is God worth to you? How much is he worth to you? In the Old Testament, the Israelites were given very specific orders, specific guidelines as to how they were to demonstrate how much God was worth to them. God's law gave them very specific directions. In these days, since since the time of Christ, we've been given much more freedom, much more freedom in the way that we worship, in the way that we gather to ascribe worth to God. And yet, the troubles that those Old Testament believers had as they gathered for worship are not much different from the troubles that we have as we gather for worship as well, are they? Today, Jesus really shows us the true meaning of worship. Jesus shows us how we are rightly to worship in his house and in our hearts. John sets the stage for the text that's before us. He tells us the Jewish Passover was near. So Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This was the first Passover that took place after Jesus' public ministry had begun. And so naturally, Jesus, as a good Jew, went up to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival that God had given him to to do. It's helpful to remember the context of this Passover celebration, particularly what it was supposed to mean for those Jews who were supposed to gather there at that temple to celebrate this festival. You see, the the festival of the Passover was when the Jews were gathering to commemorate how God had delivered them from slavery out of Egypt. When they were slaves in Egypt, God sent ten plagues to the nation of Egypt. And by that, they were led to let Israel go free. You remember, it was nine times that Pharaoh denied that request. But finally, in this final act, on that first Passover, Egypt would let them go. But it was more than just deliverance from slavery in Egypt that God provided those Israelites in that first Passover. You recall also how that tenth plague came. It was a plague of death. Death to all the firstborn. And not just to those of Egypt. It would have come upon all of the people in Israel too. Every child of Israel, the firstborn, the firstborn male in every house would have perished. But for the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb which was sacrificed on that night by each family and then painted on the posts of their house was to mark that this was a house of God. This was a family that belonged to God. And there that night at that Passover, God delivered those Israelites not just from slavery in Egypt, He delivered them from the angel of death. Freedom from slavery. Deliverance from death. That was what Passover was about. 
And every year as Israel gathered at the temple, they were to ascribe worth to God, who was their deliverer, who was their savior. They were to worship God and to praise him for delivering him from their enemies, both physical and spiritual. On this day that Jesus went into the temple to praise God for deliverance, he found nothing but distractions. The focus of the Israelites had been turned from worship and praise of God who delivers and who saves to the buzz of business in the worship life of the Israelites. John tells us in the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. The lives of these people who were gathering to worship, to ascribe worth to God who saves, they were consumed with worldly business affairs. Not only were they failing to keep a proper focus on the worship of God, but they were preventing anyone else who was coming from far away to worship God, preventing them from focusing on what it was really all about. The God who delivers. The God who saves. This, this problem of mismotivated and unfocused worship was nothing new for Israel. Even in the Old Testament, God time and time again rebuked Israel even for bringing sacrifices to them. He rebuked them because though they would go through the motions and do the actions, they did not value God at all with their hearts. They did not ascribe God the worth that was due him for giving them deliverance and giving them salvation. The worship life of Israel had long since degenerated into going through the motions failing to see and ascribe honor, praise, thanks to the God who saves, which was the whole purpose of worship. Their worship had become a detestable sin to God. So Jesus, as he came into that temple that day, the first time he entered the temple for Passover to worship God, his heart was filled with zeal, for the worship of God and for the honor that was due to God, which was entirely lacking. And he sought to turn those people's hearts back to the focus where it belonged. Get these things out of here, he said. Stop turning my father's house into a place of business. Stop turning, he said. This was a habitual sin that they were committing. Again and again and again they would worship, but with no focus on God. Oh, the shame of Israel. The shame of Israel in the very thing that was put to point them to God who was their deliverer, who was their savior. And then we see the response of those Jewish leaders who cried out, what sign are you going to show us to prove you can do these things? Do they know who they were talking to? Do they realize what worship was all about? It was all about the God who saves. And there before him was the Savior God, Jesus Christ himself, who would give deliverance from enemies, who would rescue even from death. What authority do you have, Jesus? Here we see the fullness of their true spiritual blindness. In their business affairs, they failed to recognize what all their worship was about, who all their worship was about. All of the sacrifices, the shedding of blood to pay for sins, the picture of that, that lamb that was painted on the doorpost, that pointed to Christ, whom John the Baptist himself had pointed to and said, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they failed to see it. They failed to recognize the God who saves. And as they went up to the house of God, to the temple of God, to ascribe worth to God, so many distractions 
took them off of the focus where it really should have been. So Jesus pointed their focus back to what really mattered. He pointed to himself. He gave them a sign. A sign that predicted what would come in the future. He told them about himself. Here I am, he said. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And he wasn't talking about the temple where they were worshiping. He was talking about his own body. That he would give in to death for their sins. And three days, the sign. What authority does Jesus have? I will take my life back up again. Because I am the one who has come to redeem you. I am the one who has come to save you. Well, dear friends, what would God say about our worship as we come here to St. Paul's today? Would he be distracted by prideful people who think that they have more to offer to God than what God has to offer to them? We come to hear songs of praise and we think that these, these are truly what is worth to God. We come to raise our own voices thinking that we have more to offer to God than what he has to offer to us. Our focus in worship is so quickly turned away from God where it should be, who saves us, who redeems us, who takes our sins away, that everything that we offer is but sin and tainted with guilt. But that Jesus is the one who has come to save us, to purify us, to make everything that we give to him beautiful and whole and perfect and right. Would he be disappointed to see what's truly in our heart when we drop those offerings in the plate? Because we're thinking that we have to give to meet some financial goal. Because we think that we have to give because God needs what we have to offer. Because we're giving what we think God is worth. Would he be crushed to see worshipers coming without knowing what they have actually come to do, come to see? Would he be ashamed to see called workers, pastors, teachers, who view this great privilege of sharing Christ with people as, as but, a, but an occupation? Would he be ashamed of parishioners who come to be entertained instead of edified? Who come to find a social connection instead of a connection to Jesus Christ? This is what Jesus says to you. Your misguided worship practices, your failure to ascribe honor to God, your misdirected attention on the business of life. This is why I have come. This is why have, I have been zealous for my father's house, because you were not. That is why I have obeyed the law and went to Jerusalem to glorify God at the Passover, because you did not. This is why this temple is destroyed, so that you are not. This is why I made that perfect sacrifice of the perfect lamb who takes away the sin of the world so that you would not have to make that sacrifice. And as we remember those commands of God, you shall have no other gods. We come to ascribe true worth to the only one, the only one who can save. And as we come to God's house, we rejoice that salvation he has brought to us, that deliverance from death, that freedom from sin he gives us. Don't be discouraged, friends. Even Jesus' own, own disciples didn't understand this at first. 
Even Jesus' own disciples, as he pointed away from the distractions of, of money and sacrifices to turn them to himself, even his own disciples didn't recognize this. It was only later, after Jesus had risen from the dead, our text tells us that then they understood. Then they believed Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. Then they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. Then they ascribed true worth and worship to God. No, not at the temple. The temple was destroyed. John wrote about that complex that would be destroyed in 70 AD, where true worship happened no longer at a place. It happened in the hearts of his disciples, in the hearts of his believers, as they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus spoke. And they put their trust in the God who saves. Dear friends, that is true worship. It takes place in our hearts. Because that is where the Holy Spirit is dwelling in our hearts by faith. Paul points that out. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? That God's Spirit lives in you? You! You are the place where God dwells. You, in your hearts, is where you ascribe worth to God. You, in your hearts, is where you show how much God is worth to you. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? The true worship of the believer is to honor God with our hearts. The true worship of the believer is to serve God with our lives, to look at those commandments that God gives us, to see our failure before them, but then to see the one who has fulfilled them for us and then gave his life for us to redeem them from those sin, to redeem us from those sins. And then to turn to those commands again and say, how much is God worth to me? He has given me life. He has given me eternal life. Let me follow with joy. And so we ascribe worth to God. We show him how valuable he is to us. As we put those offerings in the plate. And we do. Not to meet a budget, but because we recognize that everything that we have belongs to God. And he reminds us to be good stewards of that. And that means offering our gifts to him in thanksgiving to him for what he's done for us. And we come and we sing our beautiful songs, not because he needs them, but because he delights to know what is truly in our hearts. That Jesus was crucified for us. That we are set free from our sins. God doesn't need our money. God doesn't need our songs. God doesn't need our weekly worship. But dear friends, he treasures it. And he delights in it. And he rejoices in it because they are reflections of the faith that is in your heart, of the true belief, knowing his word, putting your trust in his word, showing the joy of your salvation that God has won for you, the freedom that he has given you, freedom not to sin, but freedom to serve God with your life. What is true worship? It's not empty sacrifices or cold and thankless hearts. Jesus teaches us true worship. It happens in his house when we come to acknowledge and proclaim his salvation, his sacrifice, which has set, it has set us free from death and sin. And true worship happens in our hearts 
when we're moved with joy to share that love that Christ has for us with our offerings, with our songs, with our lives of service to him. God bless us as we continue to worship God. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 125 in the front of your hymnal. We'll pr join to pray res the responsive prayer of the church for the season of Lent. Also in our prayers, we want to offer a prayer on behalf of the family of Dorothy Houlihan, was, who was called home to heaven on, on Wednesday. Also, we want to pray for Daniel and Brittany Ecker, who were joined in marriage yesterday. And we give thanks to God and ask the blessing on their marriage. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.
Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Lord, you give and you take away. Blessed be your name forever as you receive those who go before us. Be with the family of Dorothy Houlihan as they go through their grief and fill them with the joy of the sure and certain hope of the resurrection from the dead through Jesus our Lord. And Lord, yesterday you joined Daniel and Brittany Ecker in marriage. Be with them throughout their lives and bless their marriage together. May they always know the joy of your great love for them so that their love for each other may ever grow from you. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our service continues on page 21. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. O oh, God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Good morning. Welcome to all of you, and especially to our visitors. Happy to have you worship with us. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, next week we have the church, uh, the, the, the PTG picnic, but also uh, time changes, and it's the clocks move forward uh, before on Saturday night. So if you don't do that, you'll be an hour late. So make sure to remember to, to turn your clocks forward. Also, a couple uh, uh, call information and announcements to make. First of all, our principal, Mr. Needham, has received a call uh, to serve as principal and 7th and 8th grade teacher at First German in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Uh, so as he deliberates the call, certainly keep him, his family, in your prayers, and he may look uh, to you to, to give any advice or, or counsel as he deliberates, and, and certainly uh, uh, we happy and, and blessed to, to have him serving here. So uh, give him some encouragement as he, he deliberates. Also, we have a letter from uh, Pastor Fricky. Dear members of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, greetings in the name of our risen Savior. After prayerful consideration and seeking the advice of dozens of our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, I have decided to return the call you extended to me. Serving in the public ministry is certainly a privilege afforded by God's grace. I thank you and our Lord for the opportunity to consider where I can best serve him at this time. I will continue to keep your ministry in my prayers and ask the Lord of the Church to send you a pastor soon. In our Lord's service, Pastor Joseph Fricke. Uh, so in light of that, we'll have another call meeting. This one coming up Monday, March 12th at 7 o'clock at the school. Another call meeting on March 12th. May God richly bless your week.